spots to look at so nice today, isn't it? Aren't we lovely? Yeah. The first thing you need to observe is that the trees southerly of you grow two feet per year. Yep. And yeah. these are going to have to be cut. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ten years ago, it wasn't even an issue. Huh. It's rapidly becoming an issue, and of course, the owner is aware of that. I have to tell you that we're here at the graces of the owners today. They had a family emergency, and they're gone. Oh, uh, my. And so oh they've my. called me and allowed us to come. I have the key and so on. So it's thanks to them. We'll try to treat their house with some respect. Uh, when we go in, it'll be in 10 minutes or so. There's a porch opposite this. They're going to leave your shoes out there, and it gives you the opportunity to get the best pair when you come back out. <laughs> <laughs> We've always done that. <laughs> some things to look at. I think this is obviously the south side of the house. And there are a number of things that I'd like to point out. This is a bay bump out, if you will, uh, done to be part of the dining room where you'd store stuff. The major emphasis here was on a pond, the view of the pond mm -hmm. from the kitchen, dining, living, master bedroom. Mm -hmm. We do like to use roof windows, Velox roof windows. There are several you will see on the other side on this house. Those of you who can see through the quarter window, there's one there. Uh, I struggle with most of my clients with something called daylighting. You come to me with a house design showing me that, and I think about how do we get sunshine inside, especially into the more northern <laughs> rooms if possible. One of the very best ways is a south-facing Velux window, and you're going to see that today inside. All in all, I don't know that we'll put the lights on. You'll observe this house at its best at midday on a sunny day, and so the roof windows, we do something else. The roof window over here that you can't see shines through, and there's a wall in the center of this room. Actually, there's the man's office is up here, and the wife's office is down here. And there's an internal window allowing the light from that roof window to shine through into oh. his office mm. in the afternoon. Yeah, I can, I can see and the, the, the window. All of our houses <laughs> have all the inner walls with soundproof insulation. We use fiberglass sound insulation for differential room temperature control and sound control. And literally, it does a pretty good job uh, because she can be in her office and not hear somebody, they call each other on the phone, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all, all inner walls are yeah. insulated. And also, in our houses, more than half the people sleep with the bedroom window open all winter long. And we have monitoring alarm time temperatures of as low as 54, 55, 60, and people do that because they say they sleep so much better. Mm -hmm. There's a problem. I know from doing this for 40 years that you people here are energy tightwads. Pretty much all of you. And I just pick on somebody. I'm this fellow's old college buddy. <laughs> and I call him up from the index. Hey, I'm coming to this connectivity area next February. How about I stop and spend the night with you? Sure. So I show up on the 5th of February, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, knock on your door. We shake hands. Go inside, I got my suitcase, you showed me the bedroom was always up there. I got in my bedroom, put the suitcase down, open the window up halfway. <laughs> hair stands up in the head, you got this fresh air feed up there. It's gonna cost five or six bucks if I leave your window open all night long. It really troubles you, because you've got setback thermostats and you've added insulation and done all these things to reduce your energy bill. That's the way everybody thinks. That's not the way you need to think in this house, because it will cost you roughly 30 cents. And it doesn't matter. It really does matter in his house. And so how do I get you from this mind frame that you pretty much all have <clears throat> to think about the way you need to think in these houses? And I know it takes my homeowners two years to go from being an energy tightwad to not worrying about it anymore. They just can't. It takes a long time. Another thing I think I should point out, and this is in a way of education, a way to think. If I ask you about human comfort, a simple word, or describe comfort to me. Universally, <coughs> I get back temperature. That's the way you think. I want to be 72. Somebody only needs to be 65. That's the guy that never wears a jacket in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. That's not the answer. And I'm going to lose some of you here. This is based on over 1,200 people in monitoring. The number one thing in human comfort is the temperature of the spaces around you. In these houses, with an effective R36 insulation envelope, the temperature of the outside cold surfaces, the wall or the roof line where the insulation is or the floor, is within one degree of the air temperature in there. Your body can't tell one degree in air. It can tell two in air. It can tell one in water. 
our temperature sensor is the second largest organ we have, your skin. And we all have democracy in the way we dress. Each of us can choose to and do dress in a way that suits us individually. And despite women's lip, you females that work down at the corporation wear sweaters all summer long and shiver a lot because the guys control the temperature there. <laughs> and that always is worth a laugh so because if you work there, you know that's true. Yeah. So the number one thing, just keep in mind, is mean radiant temperature atmosphere, not temperature. The number two thing is humidity. We call the machine air conditioning. You should call it dehumidification. I have a humidity-proof envelope. It's urethane, foil. There are two layers of it. This thick, you'll see a cross-section inside. We contain the house humidity. It doesn't leak out very much. It leaks out approximately 20% of what it leaks out in all these sieves that you drove by on the way in here. So we have in this house a heavy mass storage system, roughly 100 tons of concrete. And it's reasonable to think if we put energy in there, it'll store a bunch and we get it back out. We also have another system in here that nobody thinks about. It's called 25 tons of wood. <clears throat> The wood stores humidity. The cell wall, cellulose, is a sieve to humidity movement. It's pretty good to water also. All houses, if you have a house this size, this is bigger than most houses. The houses you live in, if it's a typical two-story house, all summer long in the Northeast, from Ohio to New Brunswick, we have a pretty good humidity regime. And your house, and it's 25 tons of wood, takes on in a ballpark of 2,000 gallons of water. The problem is, about mid-October, you begin heating and you start a huge drying process. And you dry out of there, of the 2,000 gallons you have on one October, by New Year's Day, you've driven 12 or 1,400 gallons out of there at a cost of seven pounds per gallon, 930 BTUs per pound, all that evaporating water. What's that do? It makes you cold. It costs you a lot of money to get it out of there, too. This house only loses four or 500 gallons. We lose approximately 40% of what other houses do, and we do not ever need a humidifier or a dehumidifier. What you people do, by January, you know, the static electricity and the hair is straight, you gotta have a humidifier. We don't need that. So this house lived in, lived in, the daily living cycle supplying water from washing, cooking, flushing the toilet, uh, sweating. The house will stay between 40 and 60 all year round. You don't do anything. Here's the closer. At a humidity level between 40 and 60, you can't tell the temperature between 70 and 80 degrees. And you can't either. And none of you can. You think you can. The problem is not what is the temperature. The issue is, are you, are, are you not comfortable? And we keep you comfortable. I control the air ocean you live in. Most of the time, the house will be between 70 and 80 and do anything. And so that's key to really understanding this house. One other part of this comfort thing, and this is called history or whatever, it took me 15 or 20 years to really understand this. On a, on a grubby winter's day, not today, on a day when it's cloudy, eh, no, not very good, if it's not so dark that your car headlights are on at three in the afternoon or it's snowing, but grubby winter day. Despite that, the house is receiving roughly 100 BTUs per square foot, 150 going in. Magically, at 4 or 5 o'clock, it turns off. Now we have 150 going back out. The occupant of the house, between 4 and 5 o'clock, senses that. The person who was not there, who was away during the day, looks forward to getting home. This is the most comfortable place you will ever occupy. Arrives home, ah, haven't had that history. History is an important part of human comfort also. So that's, that's a little short lesson, I guess, in, in this way to think about it. Okay, so